Hi there, it's Friday the 26th of October 2018. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to International Tax Bytes ITB. Let's get started. The most important international tax topic is still digital taxation. And the US is complaining about the EU again. The two leading US senators on the Finance Committee sent a letter last week to the leaders of the European Council and the European Commission stating their concerns with the proposed digital services tax. They wrote this. The EU DST proposal has been designed to discriminate against US companies and undermine the international tax treaty system, creating a significant new transatlantic trade barrier that runs counter to the newly launched US and EU dialogue to reduce such barriers. Therefore, we urge the EU to abandon this proposal, urge the member states to delay unilateral action, and instead refocus efforts on reaching consensus with other leading economies within the OECD on any new digital taxation models. And those sentiments were echoed by US Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, who released a statement this week which says in part, I highlight again our strong concern with countries' consideration of a unilateral and unfair gross sales tax that targets our technology and internet companies. A tax should be based on income, not sales, and should not single out a specific industry for taxation under a different standard. We urge our partners to finish the OECD process with us rather than taking unilateral action in this area. But the French finance minister, Bruno Le Maire, was unmoved. Did the Trump administration ask the European Commission for authorisation of the 2017 US tax reform? He asked rhetorically this week. I do not think that the EU is going to ask Mr Trump for authorisation of the DST if it is trying to do something fair. But France does need German support. Germany has not been an enthusiastic supporter of the DST so far. It's been reported that Finance Minister Le Maire plans to meet the German Finance Minister today to try to garner more support. However, Germany is enthusiastic about a global minimum tax. France, which will head the G7 next year, is also a supporter of a global minimum tax and will put it on the G7's agenda. I can see the making of a deal. Spain's proposed DST is still proceeding. As I foreshadowed in ITB on the 12th of October, the proposed new tax has been included in Spain's draft budget bill. The government has also launched a public consultation on this topic, with comments due by the 15th of November. Another report has been issued which criticises the EU's DST proposal. The report is called Taxation of the Digitalised Economy and it's been issued by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Meanwhile, outside of Europe, Korea has indicated support for a DST. The Korean Finance Minister said last week that the government is studying the EU's DST proposal to determine whether the same type of tax should be implemented in Korea. 
If you would like to obtain a copy of the letter from the two US Senators and the AICPA report and information on Spain's public consultation on its proposed DST, you can find them all at our website or app. The OECD has released the final version of three practice notes in regard to the BEPS risks in the mining sector for developing countries. These three practice notes have been co-produced by the OECD and the IGF, the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, Metals and Sustainable Development. They were previously released in draft form for public comments. The three practice notes deal with these topics. Firstly, limiting the impact of excessive interest deductions on mining revenue, which builds on BEPS Action 4. Secondly, tax incentives in mining, limiting risks to revenue. And thirdly, monitoring the value of mineral exports. If you would like to obtain a copy of these practice notes and the public comments which were made on their draft version, please go to our website or app. The UN Tax Committee has held its latest meeting, the 17th session, in Geneva. The official summary of the meeting has not yet been released. However, you can see online all of the documents for the meeting. Two points are worth noting. There's still no decision in regard to changing the UN commentary on the definition of royalties in regard to software payments. This is an issue which the previous committee was unable to resolve. And not surprisingly, the UN committee is developing a viewpoint in regard to digital taxation. You can find all of the documents at the website for the 17th session, which you can access through our website or app. And now for the developments in Asia Pacific. In Australia, the government has announced that it will amend the offshore banking unit regime to make it compliant with BEPS Action 5 on harmful tax practices. In China, the government has decided to undertake a further round of VAT export refund increases. You remember that a first round of increases were effective on the 15th of September. I covered this topic in ITB on the 14th of September. The government has issued Circular 123, which provides details of the refund rate increases. Importantly, the increases are effective on the 1st of November, next Thursday. For a copy of Circular 123, please go to our website or app. In Macau, draft legislation has been introduced into Parliament to abolish the MOL, the Macau Offshore Law, in response to BEPS Action 5 on harmful tax practices. Under the draft legislation, the regime will be totally abolished effective the 1st of January 2021, although there will be some changes to the treatment of Macau offshore companies prior to that date. For example, income derived from IP acquired after the 16th of October 2017 will be subject to tax effective the 1st of July 2018. In New Zealand, the government has announced its plan for GST on low-value imported goods. For this purpose, low value means not exceeding 1,000 New Zealand dollars, which is about 650 US dollars. Under the current law, goods which individually have a value of 1,000 New Zealand dollars or less 
can be subject to a number of charges on importation into New Zealand in a B2C situation. Customs duty, GST and a border processing fee which is imposed by the customs authorities. Under the government's plan, there will be two important changes. Firstly, only GST will apply. Customs duty and the border processing fee won't apply. And secondly, the GST will be collected by the foreign supplier at the point of sale, not by the customs authorities at the point of import. Foreign suppliers will be required to register for and collect New Zealand GST if their annual supplies to New Zealand exceed 60,000 New Zealand dollars. The government's plan also applies to online marketplaces and re-deliverers who will be required in certain situations to collect and remit GST. The 60,000 New Zealand dollars GST registration threshold will also apply to these parties. The proposed effective date for the government's plan is the 1st of October 2019. For a copy of the government's information documents on this plan, please go to our website or app. And in Thailand, the government has extended the 7% standard rate of VAT for yet another year. And now for the developments in Europe. In Denmark, the tax authorities have released guidance on the VAT treatment of a holding company. The guidance is consistent with a European Court of Justice decision in July this year. According to the guidance, the holding of shares will be regarded as an economic activity and therefore the holding company will be entitled to input tax credits if both of two conditions are satisfied the holding company must be involved in the management of the subsidiary and the holding company must enter into transactions which are subject to VAT. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. In both Denmark and Germany, there is continued public concern over two major tax frauds, with a lot of public finger pointing at financial institutions. The common element between the tax frauds is dividend withholding tax. In Denmark, foreign investors fraudulently claimed refunds of dividend withholding tax totaling 12.7 billion krona, which is about 1.9 billion US dollars between 2012 and 2015. In Germany, the Cum-Ex transactions involved multiple claims for refunds of dividend withholding tax. It's been estimated that the transactions might have cost the tax authorities more than 10 billion euros. The European Court of Justice has decided a VAT case in regard to higher purchase agreements on referral from the UK. The taxpayer is a finance company within the Volkswagen Group. It enters into motor vehicle hire purchase agreements with customers. For that purpose, it purchases the vehicles from dealers. The referring UK court took the view that each hire purchase agreement had to be broken down for VAT purposes into two transactions a sale of the motor vehicle and an interest-bearing loan. In regard to the sale transaction based on the taxpayer's higher purchase contracts, the sale price is equal to the price which the taxpayer pays to the dealer. There's no allocation of the taxpayer's overheads and there's no recognition of profit. All of the taxpayer's overheads are allocated to the loan transaction 
and all of the taxpayer's profit from the hire purchase agreement is treated as derived from the loan transaction. I'm sure you can guess what the issue is. The sale transaction is a taxable VAT supply, but the loan transaction is exempt. The taxpayer wanted to claim an input tax credit in respect of a proportion of the VAT incurred on its overheads, even though it had allocated all of the overheads to the loan transaction. The ECJ agreed with the UK court's splitting of the higher purchase contract into the separate sale and loan transactions for VAT purposes. It also held that in the circumstances of this case, the taxpayer is entitled to claim an input tax credit on a proportion of the VAT incurred on its overheads. That proportion would generally be determined by turnover. However, in accordance with EU law, the ECJ held that an alternative calculation method can be used, provided that it guarantees a more precise result than a calculation based on turnover. In regard to that issue, the ECJ referred the matter back to the UK court. However, in doing so, it said that an appropriate calculation method must not ignore the value of the motor vehicles and it must result in an allocation of a non-negligible proportion of the overheads to the sale transaction. Importantly, the ECJ seemed to distance itself from its own 2014 decision in the Bunko Mice case. For a copy of this recent Volkswagen decision, please go to our website or app. The European Court of Justice has decided a case which concerns the interaction between a double tax treaty and the EU's freedom of movement for workers. The taxpayer is resident in Belgium but is employed in Luxembourg. Article 15 of the Belgium-Luxembourg Treaty is similar to Article 15 in the OECD Model Treaty. Under Article 15.1, salary income derived by a resident of Belgium is taxable only in Belgium, except to the extent that the employment is exercised in Luxembourg. And to that extent, the salary income may be taxed in Luxembourg. Article 23 provides for the exemption method to avoid double taxation. Income which, under the treaty, is taxable in Luxembourg shall be exempt in Belgium. Although the taxpayer's employment was based in Luxembourg, he travelled on business outside of Luxembourg. For those days on which he performed his employment duties outside Luxembourg, Article 15.1 does not permit Luxembourg to tax the salary. And thus, for those days, the salary would be taxable in Belgium. The taxpayer didn't like that result because his employment income is subject to a lower tax liability in Luxembourg than in Belgium. He came up with an interesting argument. If the effect of Article 15.1 is that his business travel outside Luxembourg causes a liability for higher Belgian tax instead of lower Luxembourg tax, it infringes on the EU's freedom of movement of workers. However, the court rejected that argument for several reasons. Firstly, it identified the factors which caused the taxpayers increased tax liability. The court said this, Thus, it appears that the alleged disadvantage is linked, one, to the choice of the states which are party to the Belgium-Luxembourg Convention of a connecting factor as regards the allocation of their powers of taxation with respect to the employment income in question, and two, 
to the more favorable tax treatment to which taxable employment income is subject in Luxembourg. Member states are free to determine the connecting factors for the purpose of allocating powers of taxation under a double tax treaty. Consequently, the mere fact that it has been decided to make the taxing power of the state of the source of the income dependent on the physical presence of a resident in the territory of that state does not constitute discrimination or different treatment prohibited by virtue of the free movement of workers. A second reason involved comparing the taxpayer's position with a Belgian resident who is employed in Belgium. The court said this, the fact that income relating to employment in Luxembourg, which is paid to a Belgian resident and corresponds to those days on which the activity that gave rise to the payment of that income was actually carried out outside Luxembourg, is subject to tax in Belgium, cannot be regarded as treating that resident less favourably than a Belgian resident employed in Belgium, who either on an occasional or regular basis actually carries out his activity outside Belgium. The employment income of the latter is taxed by Belgium in its entirety, whereas the income of the former is taxed by that state only insofar as the activity which gave rise to the payment of such income has actually been carried out outside Luxembourg. And a third reason involved comparing the taxpayer's position with a Belgian resident who is employed in Luxembourg and who undertakes no business travel outside Luxembourg. The court said this, it cannot be said that a Belgian resident who is employed in Luxembourg and whose employment is on either an occasional or regular basis effectively exercised outside that state is treated less favorably than a Belgian resident in employment in Luxembourg whose presence in Luxembourg is essential and who consequently only pursues his activity as an employed person in the territory of that state. Indeed, both of those residents benefit from the exemption laid down by the Double Tax Treaty and the Belgian national legislation, so far as concerns their income relating to days on which their employment is actually performed in Luxembourg. If you would like to obtain a copy of this decision, you can do so at our website or app. The European Commission has released a paper which recommends that member states conduct joint transfer pricing audits. For a copy of the paper, please go to our website or app. In Finland, the tax authorities have published information on the so-called preemptive discussions between the tax authorities and multinational enterprises. For a copy of this document, please go to our website or app. In Germany, the Federal Financial Court has held that the CFC rules don't apply in respect of a subsidiary resident in Cyprus. The subsidiary derived royalties from group companies in Russia and Ukraine. It leased office space in Cyprus and it had several employees who carried out administrative functions. The court held that based on the facts, the subsidiary carried on genuine economic activities in Cyprus. In accordance with the European Court of Justice decision in the Cadbury Schweppes case, application of the CFC rules in regard to the subsidiary would breach the EU's freedom of establishment. Italy's 2019 draft budget has been criticised by the European Commission 
on the basis that it presents a significant deviation from the recommended adjustment path. This is the first time that the Commission has issued a formal opinion on a Member State's draft budget. The specific complaint is this. The draft budgetary plan is not in line with the recommendation of the European Council addressed to Italy in July 2018. Italy plans a deterioration in the structural balance for 2019 that amounts to 0.8% of GDP, while the Council recommended a structural improvement of 0.6% of GDP. The Commission has requested Italy to present a revised draft budget as soon as possible, and in any event, within three weeks. For a copy of the Commission's documents on this topic, please go to our website or app. In Malta, the 2019 budget has been presented. Apart from the implementation of the ATAD-1 requirements, I noted two items of interest. The VAT rate on online publications such as e-books and e-newspapers has been reduced to 5% to be aligned with the corresponding physical media. And the government announced that a BEPS compliant patent box will be introduced. In Spain, a Supreme Court decision has created a major problem for the banks. The court has ruled that the mortgage documentation tax, which has traditionally been passed on to the borrowers, must be paid by the lending bank. This decision has been described by commentators as a radical shift in interpretation. The court has said that it will make a further ruling on this issue on the 5th of November. And now to Africa. In Mauritius, the government has issued new rules on the substance requirements for GBL, Global Business Licence Companies. But first, a quick recap. In June this year, the government announced an overhaul of the GBL system in response to BEPS Action 5 on harmful tax practices. Effective from the 1st of January 2019, GBL 2 licences will no longer be issued. From that date, only a single GBL licence will be available for issue. The tax exemption for existing GBL2 licence holders will remain available, but only during a transition period which expires on the 30th of June 2021. For companies which currently hold a GBL1 licence, there will be a change to the taxation of certain foreign income, effective the 1st of January 2019. The deemed foreign tax payment, which is available for credit purposes, will cease to apply and will be replaced by an 80% exemption. The Mauritius Financial Services Commission has now issued two circular letters in regard to the new enhanced substance requirements for holders of GBL licences. The first letter deals with holders generally. It sets out specific indicative guidelines in terms of both minimum annual expenditure and minimum employment in Mauritius in regard to a number of categories. For example, in the non-financial sector for a non-investment holding company, the indicative guidelines are minimum annual expenditure of 15,000 US dollars and minimum employment in Mauritius of one, if its annual turnover is less than 100 million US dollars, or two, if its annual turnover is more than 100 million US dollars. Interestingly, the minimum employment requirement can be satisfied either by direct employment with the license holder 
or so-called indirect employment with a management company. Also, the circular letter sets out further substance requirements in order to qualify for tax holidays. The second circular letter is focused on certain financial sector license holders. Specifically, it sets out indicative core income generating activities, which must be performed in Mauritius for these six types of license holders. For a copy of the two circular letters, please go to our website or app. In Morocco, the government has introduced the Finance Bill 2019 into Parliament. A few items caught my eye. Firstly, there's a small change in regard to the corporate income tax rates. Morocco has a progressive rate scale, with the highest rate being 31% for taxable income over 1 million dirham, which is about 105,000 US dollars. There's no change to that, but there is a rate reduction in a lower bracket. Secondly, the rate of the minimum tax on turnover has been increased from 0.5% to 0.75%. Thirdly, the tax incentive regimes for offshore banking and offshore holding companies have been abolished. And finally, a new 2.5% solidarity contribution has been introduced for companies with taxable income exceeding 40 million dirham, which is about 4.2 million US dollars. And now to the Middle East and Central Asia. Let's start in Saudi Arabia, which has been in the news this week for the wrong reasons. The government has announced the establishment of special integrated logistics zones, which will provide tax and regulatory incentives to attract foreign investment. The first zone will be established at Riyadh's International Airport. Here is a list of the approved activities in the new zones. In the UAE, the tax authorities have released guidance on the thorny issue of the VAT treatment of insurance and insurance related services. Specific topics include transitional issues relating to insurance contracts which straddle the UAE start date of VAT, the 1st of January 2018. Apportionment of overheads between taxable supplies, for example, general insurance, and tax exempt supplies, for example, life insurance. How to deal with bundled products, agents and brokers. Reinsurance. Health insurance provided for employees and their families. Real estate insurance. Zero rated exports and Islamic insurance. For a copy of the guidance, please go to our website or app. And now to the Americas. In Brazil, the tax authorities have published a ruling on the definition of the export of services. This concept is relevant for a number of Brazil's taxes, notably the tax on financial transactions and the social contributions levied on revenue. For a copy of this ruling, please go to our website or app. In Panama, amendments are being made to two tax incentives to make them compliant with BEPS Action 5 on harmful tax practices. The first is the multinational headquarters regime, which is called the SEM regime. The bill to amend that regime has recently been passed by the National Assembly. It will be effective from the 1st of January 2019. 
The second is the tax regime for call centres. That amendment law has now been published in the Government Gazette. It will also be effective from the 1st of January 2019. For a copy of the amendment law for call centres, please go to our website or app. In the US, the government has published proposed regulations on the Opportunity Zone provisions in the 2017 US tax reform legislation. According to reports, Opportunity Zones are generating a lot of interest. For a copy of the proposed regs, please go to our website or app. And speaking of US proposed regulations, it looks like we're close to the release date for the proposed regs on the amended Section 163J limitations on interest expense deductions. It's been reported that the proposed regs have been received by OMB's Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs for final review. And now for this week's treaty developments. We've had two treaties signed. In addition, Kosovo's tax authorities have reported that the Kosovo-Netherlands Treaty has been terminated, effective the 1st of September 2018. That treaty is actually between the Netherlands and the former Yugoslavia. It was signed in 1982, years before Yugoslavia's breakup. At the present time, it's used by four of the successor states to Yugoslavia. Serbia, Montenegro, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and, until the 31st of August 2018, Kosovo. For a copy of the notice from the Kosovo Tax Authorities, please go to our website or app. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 26th of October, 2018. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend. And a third reason